As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, have a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toll will be yours, and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose tinted garden neath the shade of the evergreen tree. I long for the paradise valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. As I roam the hillside, or I list to the tide, as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow in the dell, a faint picture is there of a land riding fair, where perennial flowers never fail. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river, These things I write to you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the buttress of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16. Understanding what it means and how we should conduct ourselves in the household or the family of God. We've looked at a number of different elements of that coming out of the book of 1 Timothy, and that's where we'll be again this morning. Actually, two places is all we'll go. We'll spend some time in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and then we'll run over to Acts chapter 6 toward the end, and that will be the uh, passages of our study this morning. In this, we have looked at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, and understood the picture of the church as the family of God, the assembly of the God, and the stability that it offers to the world the church is supposed to. And so under that concept, we've been looking at the principles in 1 Timothy and seeing the way God wants us to operate within the church that He has built. We talked about the importance, especially in this letter, of defending doctrine, that truth matters, and that any time we set aside truth, we're going to get into trouble, and that this letter is bookended with the idea of defending truth. Then we spent some time looking at the role of elders taking care of the household of God. And this morning, we're going to, to discuss the idea of spiritual servants, that is, deacons. Now, I choose that title, spiritual servants, for a reason. 
Because many times the common conception with deacons is this. If they are good with their hands, then they are therefore qualified to serve. Or that deacons basically are maintenance men. Now, while I appreciate anyone's ability to work with their hands and to work maintenance because that's an ability I do not have, okay? The Bible paints a picture that says before you even look at the external skill set to which you assign them in their particular service to God, they must first and foremost be men who are spiritual before God. That qualifies them then to use a specific talent that God has given them in a specific ministry in which the church has been involved. And so we want to think of them more along the line of their spiritual standing before God, not just a physical set of skills that they can use to operate. And so as we think about this study in the office of deacons, I want us to do three simple things. First of all, look at the word itself, because the word deacon is, is a very interesting word, and it's used in a number of different ways. And so we have to be sure we want to, when we run across it, we're using it correctly. Then I want us to look at the qualifications that are listed for us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and then close by looking at Acts chapter 6, where we get a snapshot of what their work looks like and what it entails. So to begin, let's begin by looking at the word itself, deacon. The word itself is actually a very generic term. It literally means servant, assistant, or minister. It's actually translated minister in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. And so it carries with it the idea of active service. Now, it can be used in a lot of different ways. For an example, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 8, Jesus is described as a servant, and the original Greek term is diakonos, which is your term for deacon. It is also used of the servants of Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 15. You shouldn't be surprised if Satan can transform himself into an angel of light that his ministers, his diakonoi, can also do the same. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 4, government is described as God's minister, his diakonoi. Further, <clears throat> Paul and his co-workers are described as simply diakonoi or deacons. Now, the words translated in your English New Testament will not necessarily be translated deacon, but the Greek word from which they're giving you that English word is diakonoi, the idea of deacon, okay? In 1 Timothy chapter, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 5 and 6, Paul said, what then is Apollos and what then is Paul, but servants, diakonoi, by which you believed. And then finally, it's also used to describe the official sense of the office of deacon as we're most commonly uh, used to associating it. Now, as we think about how it is used in a church sense, as we use it in the church, it's used in an official sense and in an unofficial sense. That's for lack of better terminology. First of all, in the official sense that we're being given here, where there are qualifications, there are a specific group of men, and they have a specific set of qualifications, and they have a specific task in the church. And we see them mentioned here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and then just briefly mentioned in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 when Paul begins that letter to the bishops and deacons in the church at Philippi. And so there is that official, official sense in which we use the word deacon. And that's the sense we're going to talk about this morning. However, the unofficial sense is that each Christian is a deacon. Okay? That each Christian is a deacon sense of the word word of a servant or a minister or an assistant. For an example, in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26, Jesus, the disciples have asked a question about who would be the greatest. And he said, the greatest among you will be your minister or servant or deacon. And then he goes on in the next phrase that picks up in verse 27 to say, or will be your slave. And that's a different term, doulos, which uh, has to do with the way it's literally translated slavery. And so there's that sense in which all Christians are deacons in the sense of the word, okay? And so that's the way the word is kind of used. So we're dealing with a servant, a minister, an assistant. And it's used in an official sense and an unofficial sense when you're talking about members of the church. Romans 16 and verse 1, Phoebe uh, is another is a, a lady that is spoken of, and the term deacon is used to describe her as well. Now let's talk about qualifications, as 1 Timothy lays out, these qualifications come to us in a couple of different parts. Really, they're summarized by, the, the qualifications of deacons are summarized by several different statements, and we'll try and break them down. First of all, in verse 1, they are to be dignified. They are to be dignified. 
And that's the word that he uses, deacons, from the ESV. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified. Okay? That's a positive affirmation that he sets forward. I want them to be dignified men. Now, dignity is the idea of a quiet disposition, not in the sense that you're necessarily just soft-spoken, but a quiet, calm disposition that inspires respect. Okay? That people, they don't have to, again, this word, they don't, they're not flashy. They're just faithful, solid people. That's what God is looking for. Too many times we're looking for a celebrity form of Christianity, and that's not the form that God wants. God wants solid, faithful people. And so these people, these, el- these deacons are to be dignified in the sense that they conduct themselves in a way that inspires respect, and that's important because deacons are called upon, in particular, to be ministry leaders. And as ministry leaders, you have to be able to inspire and have the respect of the people that you're leading. And if you do not conduct yourself in a dignified way, it's going to be hard to get that. You see, in the leadership world, it's described as two different forms of leadership. There is positional leadership, that is, you have to obey me because I'm your boss, And there is permissional leadership. That is, I may be your boss, but you follow me because you want to follow me, because I inspire you to follow me, and because my example shows you what it is like. The Bible has talked about that all along, and God has always wanted permissional leaders, men and women in specific instances, but here as far as deacons, men who can stand in this office and can inspire respect and be dignified, not just in how they conduct themselves, but also be dignified in how they treat people. Because they're going to be called to lead people in their ministry teams, and, they have to, and those people are going to be different than them, and those people are going to have different opinions, and you have to be dignified and treat people with dignity as you lead them. And so he says, first, they have to be dignified. Then negatively, he kind of states the opposite side of this coin with three phrases beginning with the word not. Number one, they must not be double-tongued. The word translated literally means to speak twice. To speak twice. And so the idea is you're over here and you're dealing with an individual and you speak to them one way. And then when that person leaves and you're over here with another individual in private behind this individual's back, you speak, but you speak something very differently about them. There's no room for this. We've got to stop. this. And by the way, as we've said with all of these qualifications when we were looking at elders, there's still qualifications of just being a Christian. We're not to be two-tongued people. We're supposed to be the same person all the time. And the way that we can, and it is amazing how some people can look at someone and smile and laugh and get along, and then the second they're out of their sight, just absolutely destroy them. The person who does that, God is saying here, that person, I don't want them involved in this, in this particular work. Number two, they must not be addicted to much wine. Now here's the first cultural, and I'm not going to belabor this point because really the individuals who advocate social drinking, this is the weakest point they could possibly make, but this is where many times they will go to make it. But it is extremely weak. The whole argument, first of all, the basic fundamental understanding, when you read the word wine in the New Testament, you have to stop associating wine with modern-day liquor. It is absolutely and fundamentally not the same. Okay? Modern distillation processes by which you can have high alcoholic concentration was invented by the Arabs in the 600s after Christ. Okay, it's, I'm not saying it wasn't possible to invent, to have alcoholic drink before then. What I'm saying is, if you wanted to have it, you would have to consume a barrel of it to get it. Okay, And so this whole argument that people are trying to make, that we're looking at wine in the New Testament and saying somehow it equates to wine today, it does not. There is nothing about the construction of the actual drink itself that equates at all. Okay, The second problem is not understanding how they used wine in their everyday life. Wine, many times for them, they lived in places where their drinking water was very corrupted. And wine that was very weak in alcoholic content, they would take and mix it with their water. 
And this is not just Christian understanding. This is Christian, Roman, Greek. Read all the different secular writings. You see it in all of them. It was a way of diluting and killing the germs that were in their drinking water. It was always mixed. And so even if the wine itself, wine is a generic term, oinos, and it can mean juice that's still in the grape, it can mean a grape juice, and it could also mean fermented. It's a generic term, okay? However, what he's talking about is this point is a person who does not have a relationship to this beverage, which is a common household item because they use it to dilute their drinking water, that they don't go and abuse this. They're not controlled by any substance that alters and that can alter their state of mind. Because when you serve God, your mind needs to be clear. And I would, I know our deacons have been given the book <clears throat> Dynamic Deacons, and I would encourage every person to read what Aubrey Johnson says in his estimation of this text as to why, common sense wise, a deacon should not touch it. Really, why a Christian should not touch it. But in this, you have a person who's not under the control. Because if a person becomes under the control of a substance, they have ceased to be under the control of Christ. And that is a lordship problem. Okay? And so the deacon is not to be one who is controlled by any substance. Number three, he's not to be greedy for dishonest gain. Not to be greedy for dishonest gain. He's not looking to make money. He's not looking to siphon money. He's not looking to embezzle money. And one of the reasons why deacons really, in particular, have to be men who are not given to dishonest gain is because when you lead a ministry, you usually need to have a budget, and that budget you're going to have to manage. And you have to be trusted to be able to manage that without embezzling money, okay? It, it, greed, like all these other, all these other things, are, they're really heart issues. You talk about the tongue. You talk about being addicted to a substance. You talk about being greedy for dishonest gain. They're all Christian heart issues, which will later be shown in the next verse as he, as he uh, unfolds these qualifications. So first of all, he's to be dignified. And so being dignified, inspiring respect by doing things and behaving in a dignified way and by rejecting other things make him a dignified and qualified candidate. Number two. They are to be faithful. Verse 9. It says <clears throat> that they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So they must hold, they must grasp and possess the mystery of the faith. Mystery is a word that was used to describe the gospel that had to do with the fact that under the Old Testament, God did not fully reveal everything he was going to do. But the New Testament has shown us the full revelation of what God intended to do. So he must hold the mystery of the faith. Every time the word, sometimes a mistake is made in understanding the Bible because when we see the word faith, we want to talk about and translate it as an individual's personal faith. But sometimes the Bible uses the word faith in the sense of the whole system of Christianity. And many times that word faith will be prefaced by the word the, the faith. For an example, Jude in verse 3. I wanted to write to you concerning things of our common salvation, but it was more needful for me to write to you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Not talking about just their personal faith, but the entire system of Christianity. Okay? And as we'll see in just a moment in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, the, great, the word of the Lord greatly multiplied, and a great number of priests were obedient to the faith. That is, they became Christians. They obeyed the gospel. And so the deacon here, under discussion that his faith, he is supposed to hold the mystery of the faith. This has to do with his understanding and his grounding in the Scriptures and what God has revealed for what the gospel is and how, who the church is and how the church is supposed to operate. The deacon has to have a grasp on those things. He must be biblically and firmly rooted in that. And there are a million different practical reasons as to why that is. Leadership position one. Two, if they're going to be involved in ministry, they need to be sure they know Scripture well enough that they're not devising a ministry that's going to contradict something that's written in Scripture. And on and on the list can go. And they are to hold it with a clean conscience, which is what he says at the beginning of the letter, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, that the aim of the commandment is love 
from a pure heart and a clean conscience. It produces this clean conscience. He's to be a man who is faithful, and that's why we call them spiritual servants, because first they are to be men of faith. Holding the mystery of faith with a pure, with a clean conscience. So you see, holding the mystery of the faith, that's his commitment to the gospel system, with a clean conscience has to do with his faithfulness, his faith. Then in verse 10, it expounds upon that principle of his faith when it says, <clears throat> And let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Some people have had the notion throughout the years that what we should do is we have a person who's a good man, and he's qualified in, in many ways, but he doesn't meet all the qualifications. By the way, these are qualifications. They're not optional. They're mandatory. And it's not a majority of qualifications. It is all qualifications. Okay? So, <clears throat> you get a person, and they're not, maybe, maybe not as faithful as they should be or could be, and we say, you know what? We're going to get them involved, so we'll make them a deacon and get them involved, and that will help them grow in their faith. Listen, that is in direct opposition to what God has revealed. I'm not opposed to getting people involved and helping them develop their faith, but you don't put them in a leadership position to do it because it will crush them and it will end up hurting more people in the process. God says, let them also first be tested. And the word is used to describe in original Greek of testing and proving metals, the worth of a metal. That is, they have to be individuals who are faithful. They have to have been proven faithful to the Lord. Then they're given and handed over a work in a, an official capacity. If a person will not work without the title, I'm not convinced they're going to work with the title. But that's what too many people are wanting. They're wanting the title. I won't do it until I get the title. But then you're not qualified for it. Because you have to first prove yourself. You've got to show that you're willing to work for the Lord. Then, he says, let them serve as a deacon. And it's an imperative command. If a man is qualified and he has proven himself, let him serve. Imperative. Then it adds this last attachment at the end, if he be found blameless. Now, blameless obviously is not the idea of sinless perfection. That's foolishness. What it means is this is a person who has no standing complaint against them. It doesn't mean they've never done wrong. It doesn't even mean they've never even done wrong to another individual. It means that they have the disposition that even if they do wrong, they're willing to acknowledge they're wrong. Listen, there is nothing more dangerous than a person in leadership who does not think they do wrong. And a person who will not admit their wrongs. And the way that, and that's, what, listen, that's an important characteristic we have to look at with people. If I'm not willing to admit that I did something wrong and go to a person an un, with an unqualified seeking of forgiveness, I don't want that person anywhere near leadership in the church. And God doesn't either. Because it goes back to what we said in a previous sermon. That individual is more concerned with being right than what is right. And that's always a problem. And so if he is found blameless, though, if he is found to be faithful, serve him. Then he moves, <clears throat> number three, on to the family. The New American Standard, I believe, rendered the word um, women here. The word is a very generic term, but the flow of the text, the more accurate rendering, even though the New American Standard is the most literal of rending, renderings there is, but it's a translation, and they all have their different philosophies in how they do things. The better translation in this context is wives, talking about the wives of deacons, okay? Now, people say, why does he give the qualifications of deacons' wives and not elders' wives? Well, because it's a little bit different. When you're serving in the office of an elder, there are things that remain highly confidential and things that have to be administered to that only the elders themselves can be privy to. But when you're a deacon and you're over a ministry where you've got many people involved, especially as we'll see in Acts chapter 6, say, taking care of widows and distributing food, 
Well, certainly their wives are going to be with them. Their wives are going to be highly involved in that ministry. And so he sets forth certain qualifications for them. He says, first of all, they have to also <clears throat> be dignified, the same quiet restraint, uh, quiet disposition that inspires respect. They cannot be slanderers. They can't be people who run down and tell church business to everybody. <clears throat> they must be sober-minded, serious-minded, clear-headed in their judgment. And they must be, as this last qualification says, faithful in all things. And I love the way one person put it. They just have to be absolutely trustworthy. Absolutely trustworthy. Because when you step into a leadership position, you learn things about people. And some people trust you and they confide in you. And if you can't learn to keep that information, then you need to get out and leave it alone. Because it's not your information to pass along. And so there has to be this sense of dignity and utter trustworthiness amongst the people who would lead, even in their families. But <clears throat> he goes on to describe then in verse 12, the management of their households. He says, let them be the husbands of one wife. This is not a qualification that says if a person has ever been through a divorce, they can never serve as a deacon. That's not what this phrase means. Okay? It's not what it means. If a person has been scripturally divorced and scripturally remarried, they are still the husband of one wife. And if, you, and if you push back against that and you challenge that, then you would then make the argument that the person who scripturally divorces and scripturally remarries is actually the husband of two wives. Is that what we want to say? The husband of one wife means that the person is scripturally married. It does not mean... And you know, we really do a disservice to people who've already had to go through the pain of divorce that sometimes we want to throw them under the church bus wheels and roll over them again and say, no, you can't ever serve again, even though you did nothing wrong in the process. That's not what this is about. It's a man who is a loving, faithful husband, who is a one-woman man, and who is scripturally married if he's had to go through the pain of divorce. But number two, he must also manage their children well, literally to stand before their children, to lead them. It's not just... <clears throat> that he's a stern disciplinarian, but that he also knows how to develop his children. It's not enough just to, and I understand this gets into parenting philosophies, but it's not enough just to spank our children if we don't actually walk through the process with them and say, now, what did you, why did you get in trouble? Why did you do that? What do you think you probably should have done what are you going to do next time? What are we doing then? We're not just spanking our children and telling them they did wrong. We're helping them to think through what went wrong and how to react better the next time. That's leading your children. That's managing and guiding their hearts, not just putting on punitive punishment. Then he says, those <clears throat> who do this will receive a great reward in verse 13. He says, first of all, for those who serve well as deacons, and the word translated well is a word that means beautiful, attractive, and winsome. That is, their service is just, not that they've never made any mistakes, but their service is solid and beautiful in what they've been able to do for the church of the Lord. They gain a good standing for themselves, he says. And the good standing, some people see this as, um, <clears throat> it has to do with the word translated standing. I think uh, New American Standard rendered high standing. Uh, the word itself is kind of like a step up on a ladder, like a rung. And so some people see that, that word picture and they say it means that he qualifies himself for maybe greater service as an elder. Um, maybe, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that's what it's talking about. Because there's no inclination in Scripture that says to be an elder you have to have served as a deacon. There are plenty of people who went straight into eldership and never served as deacons that there, there's just no inclination of that. The idea, I think, better behind the good standing is that the people of God hold him in respect 
because he has a solid reputation of being a person who is faithful to God and he gets the work of God done. And so he has a good reputation and then he also has great confidence in the faith. That is, a person can look back over their ministry, they can look over what they've done as a deacon, and they, it certainly wasn't perfect and they were going to be haunted by mistakes that they made, but they know they're in good standing before God because they served him and they, they were faithful to him. And it's not arrogant to say that you've been faithful to your Lord. So those are the qualifications. Now quickly, let's look at their work. <clears throat> Number one, just some preliminary thoughts. There is no text of Scripture that we can go to that says, deacons, here is your ministry list. Or churches, elders, these are the ministries where deacons are serving. It doesn't happen that way. And I think for good reason. Because in different cultures, the church looks, a different, looks differently in the sense that how they serve their communities differently. Pe communities are different. Cultures are different. And so there's, there's not this hard, fast rule on that. It's left up to the autonomy of the local leadership in understanding those things, although I do believe God lays out there are certain ministries that are certainly non-negotiable no matter where you put them. But we do have principles to help us guide. So let's look then at Acts chapter 6 very briefly and watch what is taking place in this text. It says, number one, there's a problem that develops. Now, in these days, the disciples were increasing in number, and a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So you have the church in Jerusalem is growing, and many people rightly, I think, if you do the numbers based upon Acts 2 and Acts 4 and Acts 5 and then come to Acts 6, it's very feasible that the church in Jerusalem, by the time of Acts chapter 6, is 20,000 members strong. Okay? Now, when you've got 20,000 members and you're growing rapidly, something's going to fall through the cracks, okay? It just happens. Now, there's this dispute between the Hellenists, these Greek-speaking Jews who many times lived in the dispersion and spoke Greek and used the Septuagint versus the Hebrews, those Jews that lived in Palestine that spoke Aramaic. And they looked down upon those who were Greek because they weren't as Jewish as them. And so... The Hellenists believe that their widows are being purposefully neglected in the church's financial support of them. So, this is what happens. The twelve summon the full number of the disciples. So he calls, they call the church together, and I want you to watch what they do. They prioritize. It is not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God to serve tables. Now, is he saying that serving tables is beneath the apostles? Who in this function, you don't have elders at this point yet. You don't necessarily need them at this point yet with the apostles. But later on in Acts, you will here in just a couple of chapters. Is he saying that they're too good for that? No. He's saying we have a, as the apostles, they had a specific task commissioned by Jesus himself to preach the gospel to every creature. And not just anybody could do what the apostles could do. So they said it would be wrong for us to go and take care of every widow and neglect the preaching of the gospel to the world. Because we are uniquely qualified as apostles to do that. But... We want to make sure the work is done. And so what we're seeing develop is the idea of priorities. That God, as he assigns these roles, where you have elders and deacons and preachers and ministers, and you have uh, different people in the church and their services, no work is really more important than the other, but they all have unique functions. And one of the reasons why churches don't function properly is because they don't understand what those functions are and they don't stay in the lanes of their role. Where you've got sometimes elders reaching down and they're doing deacon's work and there's nothing, again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it's not just beneath them, it's just not their job. And as they're doing the work of deacons, their work as an elder is being neglected. And on and on we could go with this. The, the apostles are showing this very early that you've got to keep your priorities straight. And so he says, let's bring in prototypes is what I will call it, prototypes of what deacons would look like in the church. He says, therefore, brothers, verse 3, pick out from among you seven men 
that is the Hellenists, the ones that are complaining, of good repute, full of the Spirit and wisdom. You see, even then, he wanted spiritual men who we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. This is an important work we want to see, and if you have a complaint about it, then let's draw up a solution. Bring, me se- bring us seven men. Bring us these men, and we'll assign them to the task that the work is done. Then the men are picked, verses 5 and 6. When it pleased the whole gathering, they chose Stephen, and on and on. You see the seven men that are chosen in verse 5. And it says, they set them before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. They commissioned them for that work. Now, what happens? Watch this. You've got men serving, basically, as prototypes of deacons. You've got the leaders, the apostles, who know their job, and they're doing it. You've got deacons that they're setting in this particular position. They know their job, and they're doing it. Now, what is the result when the leaders follow their job in this position and the leaders follow their job in this position, what happens? And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples was great, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Sometimes church growth does not happen because we're not in our lanes correctly. And when elders understand and do their work, and when deacons understand and do their work, and there are multiple things that could be said here, that some of the times elders have to step in and do deacons' work because their deacon won't do its work. And so, but when you can get those things functioning, when you can get the elders rolling in their lane, you can get the deacons trustworthy and rolling in their lane, and then the members getting involved in the ministries underneath the deacons, then you can begin rolling like a freight train. But the point is basically this about deacons. The elders in this particular scenario, their main focus is the spiritual welfare of people, checking on people. Deacons are taking care of other things that are important. But the elder's primary focus is on people. The deacon's primary focus is on leading ministries that are outreaching. Whether they be in taking care of facilities to help us in that outreach, whether they be in designing ministries to reach out in communities, whether it, it visitation programs, taking care of our widows, those who are in need, Those are all things that are important. That's what deacons are there to do. It's an important work. They're there to head up that. And deacons deacons were never intended to be Lone Star Ranger. I mean, just one person doing the whole thing. They were meant to lead the ministry team and to enlist people into service. That's the role. So, <clears throat> conduct in the house of God when it comes to these spiritual servants. This is what God wants them to do. And listen, to every man who has ever served as a deacon in the past and to those who are serving as a deacon now, thank you. Your work is important, and you need to know that. You need to know that. The Lord revealed from heaven that He wanted a specific person to fulfill a specific role and you've stepped into a God-ordained role. That's an important thing. And as a matter of fact, it actually makes you look just like our Lord. Matthew 20 and verse 28, he said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, diakonos, deacon, but to serve, diakonoi. And so when you serve faithfully in your office, you're showing the world, you're showing the church, Jesus. But you know, that same text in Matthew 20 and verse 28 says that Jesus came to serve us in the sense that he gave his life for us that we might be free. As a ransom for all. So if a person this morning is outside of Christ, you can be enlisted into the service of Christ and begin your service in an unofficial capacity as a deacon. Or maybe as a New Testament Christian, we have not been serving the way that God wants us to. 
He wants us to be busy. And not busy for the sake of being busy, but busy with intent and focus and purpose and understanding what is taking place. And maybe someone this morning doesn't feel that they've been faithful. Maybe, they want to, maybe that's a public thing. Maybe that's a private thing. Whatever it is, we just want to try and help one another. And if we can do that this morning, that's what we desire to do as we stand and sing this song. Sinners Jesus will receive Sound this word of grace to all Who the heavenly pathway leave All who linger, all who fall Sing it all and o'er again Christ receive the sinful man, make a man since clear and plain. Christ receive the sinful man. Now my heart condemns me not. Pure i mm-hmm.